So we're very pleased to say that, that that person responsible for all that is here today. And of course, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's Gerard Batten, MEP. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? It's not an unusual experience for me to have the microphone turned off. <laughs> Something you have to learn to live with in the European Parliament. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to Anne and Bill Woodhouse for opening up their lovely grounds, their garden to us today. It's been an absolutely fantastic event and what a better way to spend the first day of September into a beautiful little part of England that we love so much. Um, I was going to thank the musicians as well because I really enjoyed the tuneful music. That made a nice change as well. Um, and, but they've gone, but, uh, ah, there he is. Charles, thank you very much for you and your lovely wife. We really enjoyed it. Now, um, as you all know, I've been doing this job now for six months. And uh, in the past, when we, over the previous two years, as you may remember, I'm sure we had about three leadership elections. And people would say to me, why don't you go for the leadership of the party? And I used to say, well, I've got a very good reason for not doing that. And they'd say, what is it? And I said, I think I might win. <laughs> and then, of course, we came to September, I'm um, sorry, um, February this year, when I thought I didn't have any choice but to go for it because the alternative was to watch the party disappear. We really were on the brink of annihilation, uh, quite apart from the political faux pas that we committed for the previous two years. Financially, we were about to go bankrupt. And a lot of people have said to me, thank you for saving the party. Well, I didn't save the party. The members have saved the party. People like you. What I did, in my view, is to stand up and say and do the obvious. And David was very kind about me there. And I, and I absolutely agree with what he was saying. We now live in a kind of Orwellian, Kafka-esque society where insane things happen every day. And I feel a responsibility to say things and to speak the plain truth as I see it because I can. I don't need another job after this one. I can retire. But if you are less than retirement age, like the teacher that David was describing, you cannot even say the obvious. It is now like living in the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, where you cannot speak the truth without you are endangering your livelihood. Then that is the insane position that we have arrived at. And when we had the Prime Minister this week in South Africa saying that it was OK for the South African government to take away the lands of white farmers, provided it is done legally and in the best possible taste. Can you imagine if a prime minister in the 1930s had said, it's OK for the Nazis to appropriate the property of the Jews, provided it's legal? Well, it was legal under the Nazis' law. And what's happening in South Africa is no doubt legal, under their law, if it's not, they'll pass laws. But that Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, has stood up and said, basically, it is OK to ethnically cleanse people in South Africa if it's legal. Well, it's not, and people have to say it's not right. And that is the, the only the most obvious example this week of insanity that we now live under with this absolutely absurd Prime Minister that we have, leading an absurd government in an absurd House of Commons in an absurd situation. What's happened with Brexit for the last two years? Very, very little. What we've seen is defeat snatched from the jaws of victory. If we'd have had a genuine patriotic Prime Minister after the referendum and a patriotic House of Commons, what would they have done? The week after the referendum, they would have repealed the 1972 European Communities Act. We would have then ceased to be members of the European Union under our law. And we could have said, forget Article 50, that's your law. We're not doing it that way. We're doing it our way. 
And Bill Cash, to his credit, actually wrote a draft act of parliament explaining exactly how it could be done. He beat me to it. I don't know how to write an act of parliament, so I'm glad that he did it for me. But I put it in my exit plan. You repeal the act of, uh, you repeal the 72 European Communities Act. You then say to the EU, don't worry, all law stays in place, but we will now repeal it and amend it in accordance with our priorities and our timescale. First of all, tell you what, you can have a free trade agreement. We can continue on the same terms as now, except you can have the free movement of goods, services and capital. You can't have people. How about that? And if you don't want it, no problem. Let us know in a week and we'll go on to World Trade Organization terms. That's what they would have done. <laughs> then they would have said, we'll clear up this issue of citizens' rights because we will give we will continue the citizens' rights for European citizens who are here now, up until the day we leave, provided you do the same for our citizens over there. Is it a deal, yes or no? And when they say yes, because they're going to want to do that, we'll say then we've got probably, I, I can't remember the exact figure, so excuse me, about 175,000 pieces of legislation, every jot and tittle, paragraph and word, which then cannot be repealed or amended in two years. What we would say is we're going to work now through our priorities. We're going to deal with the big stuff, the obvious stuff, and the uniform size of wine glasses. I'll tell you what, we'll leave that on the back burner. We may deal with that in five or 10 years time. Let's not worry about it. But who have we got? We need the uh, buccaneering spirit of Sir Francis Drake, and we've got the comedic spirit of Charlie Drake. If you want slapstick humour, just look at the way the government has conducted this. They constantly go off to Brussels and say, oh, please, sir, Mr Barnier, how may we leave? And he said, oh, I, very difficult. I don't think we can do it. <laughs> and that's gone on for two years. What do they expect? We shouldn't be going and asking them how we can leave. We should be telling them how it's going to work. but they don't want it to happen and they don't want it to work. What I said, and I, I wrote a little book about this, in 2014 I published this, and then I wrote an exit plan in 2017. If we won the referendum, I said, and it wasn't even certain we'd get one then, I said, what will happen is you will have a tooth and nail trench warfare campaign fought by the establishment to make it not happen. Either they will try to overturn the referendum completely or they will try to end up with a withdrawal agreement where we leave in name but not in reality. And where does it look like we're going? And a withdrawal agreement where we're going to pay them 39 billion for the privilege of leaving. No guarantee we won't have to pay them more money afterwards. We're going to have to obey a lot of their laws. We're going to have to stay under the jurisdiction of the European Court and we'll probably have open borders more or less anyway. So on that basis, what I believe the Swiss or Norwegian model, uh, where they have those kind of conditions, if we achieve that, then you might as well have not bothered with the referendum. But what Mrs May is going to do, I'm sure, if she can't overturn the referendum completely, is arrive at such a withdrawal agreement, and then you'll, they'll tell you what a magnificent diplomatic triumph it is and they expect the British people to be mug enough to swallow it. Well, this is where UKIP comes in. Why do we still need UKIP and where are we today? Well, where we are today, I'm very pleased to say, is very much on the up. When I took over, quite frankly, I wasn't sure that I could save the party. I needed £100,000 in cash straight away or we would have gone bust. And I said, no good going to the big donors. They've seen their money wasted by uh, the previous management. So what do I do? I'll ask the members. And I went and asked the members for £100,000. And I sat in my office talking to my staff, said, you know, I'm not sure that we're going to do this. And what did we get? We got £300,000. <laughs> that got us over that immediate problem. And what then what do we do about members? Membership had gone down, probably at its worst point, it went down to about 18,000 after people flooded out after our previous uh, leader, the less said about him, the better. But people were flooding out. We're now back up to about uh, 23 and a half, we are, or more than that, uh, the figures go up every week. We're now 
pretty much heading towards 24,000 members. That gives us an income of about £600,000 a year. That can pay for head office. Uh, and if it wasn't for the small band of dedicated people at head office on not great salaries, the party wouldn't exist either. Please don't forget them. They're the people that make the machine run at the level that it needs to. So the party now is comfortably in the black financially. I haven't taken a penny out to run, uh, to run what I need to run. I've operated on a shoestring pretty much. That's looking up. Back in July, I was able to hire a permanent full-time press officer. I've raised money through the Patrons Club Limited, which is already where over £100,000 come into that from generous donors who pay £1,000 a year. They're very happy with the way things are going. More people are joining. I'm now taking on a permanent per, uh, personal assistant on uh, tomorrow, uh, Monday, in actual fact, Liz Phillips. Many of you know, will know Liz. So I'll have a bit of a, a, a bit of a staff behind me that will enable me to do the things that I need to do. That's the party. Financially, it's secure now. Members are coming back in. And as you will all know, I put the party on red alert a couple of months ago to say there may be an election. We have to be ready for it. People are now lining up to be candidates. We're putting candidates in place as fast as we can so that we can fight an election when it, when it comes. Now, I know what a lot of you will be thinking and a lot of the voters think, well, you know, under first past the post, it, we, it's very difficult to win. You can't win. UKIP in the English elections in May got 6% of the vote. In some polls, we're polling between 6 and 8% of the vote now. You're not going to win a seat on six to eight percent of the vote but I tell you what you will do you'll cause mayhem in the marginal constituencies where elections are now fought. Where I live in, uh, in the London borough of Newham in West Ham we've had a Labour MP for the last 120 years with one exception after the war I think. You've got conservative constituencies where you've probably had a conservative MP for 200 years they don't worry about that. You can put a fence post up with a blue rosette or a red rosette and it's going to win. Well, where we can cause a difference in the next election, whenever it comes, if it comes quickly, is in the marginal seats, where we can take that certainty away from the Tories and Labour. And make no mistake about it, they both intend to betray this country and either overturn the referendum or do what I said, is not really leave at all. That's our immediate tactic. That's what we're going to be doing in the immediate future is fighting in those marginals. And I'm going to produce a list for conference of the top 20 seats where you have remain MPs in seats that voted leave and we are going to lose them their seats because we can do that. In the mid to longer term, what I want to do is build the party up so that we can win in first past the post. Now, we've been preparing the way for a very long time. You don't get anywhere in British politics without a reputation built up over a long period of time, and we've done that. We've damaged our reputation over the last couple of years, so we all have a responsibility now to actually build that up and make us trustworthy and vote worthy. And I believe one of the key things to doing that is talking about the things that people care about. Yes, they care about the National Health Service. Yes, they care about their standard of living, but they also care about where this country is going culturally, what we believe and the kind of society we are, which David has been talking about. And you've probably seen some of my more uh, noteworthy interviews on the TV where I've been questioned about my views on extreme Islam. I will say what I believe and what I believe to be true because I have a responsibility to do that and I have the freedom to do that because like I said to you, I don't have to worry about my future employment. I feel so sorry for people who are out there now in, in whatever job they have, whether it be in education, in the health service, everyday jobs where they frighten to actually say the truth and the obvious about things. And that doesn't mean being nasty to anybody. That doesn't mean insulting anybody. It just means being able to say black is black, white is white, and the sky is blue. And we are moving into a very frightening place now, which is reminiscent of totalitarian regimes of the past, where we cannot say what we think. So I think the free speech issue is going to be a very big issue coming along. Now, as you all know, we've got the conference uh, on the 21st and the 22nd of this month. 
I have been very busy for the last month putting the finishing touches to a interim manifesto, which was supposed to be quite short and is now about 16 pages. I can tell you that the draft manifesto that we're working from is about 105 pages, but what I've tried to do is to distill that down into bullet point policies which people, ordinary people can understand and which will be popular and which we can develop going forward. I don't want to give too much away, but I think I have said on the TV and so far everybody has agreed with it, we are going to abolish the BBC licence fee. Somebody gave me a brilliant idea earlier on, which is, I think we're going to do this. We'll have a competition at the conference and we'll give everyone a piece of paper with the words BBC on it and we'll have a prize for who can come up with the best interpretation of what BBC stands for. The, there are no prizes for the Brussels Broadcasting Corporation because it's already been done. So you've really got to be creative in this one. Uh, and I think we'll have a bottle of champagne or something similar as the prize. But what a, the, the, the conference is already well on the way to being a full house. It's, it seats 1,500. We're doing it in the same place that we did the EGM back in February. About 1,500 seats. We are already covered our costs for the venue. We've got enough money in on ticket sales. We're heading towards a full house. I want that place packed. The media will be turning up in order, I'm sure, to do whatever hatchet job they think they can. We want, we want it full of ordinary, decent UKIPers who are going to come along, support their party and show that we are a fighting force for the future. We'll be talking about these new policies. We will be having spokesmen like David and other people talk about their areas of policy. And what I want us to do is to go onwards from that conference with a fighting spirit and go back to the constituencies, organise their constituencies and organise candidates for election. And let me tell you why. UKIP is the only opposition in this country. When I stood up to this job, I thought I've got to do it because I'm actually an MEP. I'm getting paid a salary. Everyone here is a volunteer. Up and down the country, it is full of volunteers who do it for nothing. It costs them money. And I thought, I have a responsibility to save this party for those people. My objective when I did it was very simple, just to make it bigger in terms of membership, financially sound, and on a footing to fight for the future. That's what I want to do. But in addition to that, what I also want to do is to put it on the right course politically. So we're moving into a place that I think is going to be popular with the British people. I want UKIP to be a populist party in the real meaning of the word. I want our policies to be popular with the people. And I'm sure it won't have escaped your attention. The word popularist now is a pejorative term. Well, why is that? I'll tell you why. It's because the political establishment across the Western world is doing so many things to its own peoples that are deeply unpopular. Well, I'd like to see that reversed. And I want UKIP to be in the forefront, the vanguard of that reversal. UKIP is the only opposition. If we go, if we disappear off the political scene, you will not only get more of the same, you will get much, much, much more of the same. And do you want it? No. Well, you better do something about it then. And you're all members of UKIP, so you've made a very good start. Now, that's where we are. I hope I'm going to see as many of you at uh, conference as possible. Go off to a, an even bigger future from that. I hope that we'll be able to make a very positive announcements about membership numbers. And I'm sure that we'll put a lot more, more on after the conference. I've had to do a few things which some people have not been entirely comfortable with. And I haven't done that just for the sake of it, but because I felt that they needed doing or they needed saying. And I'm very pleased to say that the vast majority of comments I get back from members, they approve of what I've been doing and what I've been saying. And I hope that's true of, of you today here. And I hope that will be true at the conference and people will have their opportunity to voice their support or otherwise when we get there. Now, I'll wrap up. I did bring along uh, some copies of my little book, which I intended to use uh, to raise funds for the branch. So if anybody would like one, I'll autograph it and they can give an uh, appropriate donation 
to the branch. Um, and I don't know who's, who's who take that. That will be uh, Steve, I guess, Steve Unwin or somebody. You can give the money to them. Uh, I've only got three left. Two seem to have disappeared. But if the people who were looking at them would like to me to oh. sign it, then they can, uh, they can also make a donation. So thank you very much for your support. I couldn't do anything without the members. I'm really enjoying making the right decisions instead of seeing the wrong decisions being made. And the bigger we get, the more income that comes into the party, the more people I can employ to do things, the easier those decisions are going to get to be made. So please do everything you can to support the party. I know you are anyway. I'd really like to thank you for everything you've done. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to the conference in a few weeks time.